I don't know about you, but Christmas um, for me has changed over the years. I, I can remember as a, as a, as a kid the, the anticipation that led up to Christmas. And it all really for me uh, as a kid growing up started the Friday after Thanksgiving. It was, it was a family tradition of ours. Um, we did, um, my dad's side of the family went to my grandparents uh, at Thanksgiving and all his brothers um, I think he had seven or eight brothers, seven brothers maybe, I can't remember. And then my aunt, the one girl, we'd all gather at my grandparents' house. Uh, we would do Thanksgiving there at Hale Center. Anybody know where Hale Center is in Texas? A few people, yeah. It's up in the, pan, uh, up in the panhandle um, and in between uh, Lubbock and, um, yeah, one of those places. Um, and, and yeah, that, that's where we spent and we, we would go there on Wednesday um, or Tuesday afternoon, usually after school, and we'd, we'd drive. Uh, it was about a four-hour drive or so, if I remember correctly. And then, but then after that, we would, we would come back home, and then that's when our, the, the Smith household, we would kind of transform into Christmas, decorating the tree. Uh, my dad would put on the lights on, on, on the roof, uh, all that kind of good stuff. And it was really, I, I, loved, I loved the Christmas season, because as a kid in school, I knew we only had a few more weeks left of school, and then we were on a long break. There would be Christmas parties in, in school and Christmas parties, you know, at church and a lot of different stuff. We would do Christmas concerts, Christmas plays. Um, presents would magically start appearing under the tree, and, and some of them had my name on them. So that was always exciting. And, and then on, around Christmas time, we did a, a, a reunion on my mom's side of the family. My grandparents, we, we would do this big old shindig, and I, I always loved that growing up. And it was awesome. I loved it. Matter of fact, I loved the buildup probably a little more than, than the actual day. But anyway, Christmas, Christmas was great. But then something for me changed. And I think what changed was I, I grew up, and now I was one of the adults that was responsible for, for all of these things, responsibilities like helping with decorating. You know, that, was, that just kind of happened. As a kid, that just happened. Um, you know, I might put a couple of ornaments on the tree or something, but that just happened in my world. Or, or for get, now going out and buying uh, the, the gifts and, and then wrapping those things uh, help responsible for some of the party stuff or you know now I'm the one dri driving as we're traveling I always just sat in the back you know and enjoyed life took a nap did whatever but now I'm driving and we're helping out when our, our kids are kind of past this stage now but when you know when they were doing parties and stuff we would we would help out with those and plan those and we'd go to concert and just kind of on and on but and the reality is is that as a kid I never even thought about those things those were just those were just parts of Christmas and I was excited about those things and and but as an adult you know now it, I, I'm on a, on a different side and and all of a sudden it, it's not as as fun as it used to be but don't get me wrong, I, I still love Christmas, and it's, it's still my favorite time of the year, right behind when, when football season starts. That's really my favorite time of the year. Uh, we need more trees and carols and things for that. Um, but, but, but Christmas is, is really one of my favorite times of the year, and I'm probably, I'm probably not alone when I say this, but sometimes when I think about December, I just kind of give it one of these. <sighs> It's a, it's a little bit of a, a, a sigh, and and I know and I know that's 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 a horrible way to think, and I also sigh. I also give it one of those sighs around October when the Hallmark Channel starts showing nonstop Christmas shows that all have the same plot, the same character, same love story. Because here's the deal: when Hallmark starts showing those shows in October, they stop showing the Golden Girls. And I can't see the Golden Girls until January. And the Golden Girls is, is how we fall asleep in our household. So uh, my, my rhythm's all, all, all off. So. But anyway, for some of us, busy isn't just something that comes around once a year at Christmas. It's, it feels like it's just all year long. And, and we feel like our lives can, can sometimes just be one big, one big sigh. Because, you know, we're running from meeting to a meeting, from class to class, from event, event to event, from game to game, concert to go. We're just kind of all over the place, and we feel like we never get a chance just to take a breath, to, to take a break, or, or even just to, to take a nap. In, in a busy life, you know this, a busy life can be exhausting. It can be stressful. Um, it, can, it can just kind of suck the joy right out of life. And some of you feel this weight uh, a lot, and, and it just seems to, to get a little heavier at Christmas because on top of the normal busyness that you have in life, then you get all the, the, the crazy of Christmas. But I, I want to let you in on a little secret. Um, that's really not how God intended for you and I 
to live. God, God didn't intend for us to, to run ourselves until we drop from exhaustion. God, here's the thing. God isn't impressed by a, a, a calendar that's full of activity. That doesn't, really, that doesn't really impress him. And he certainly doesn't want us to ruin his birthday by making ourselves miserable with all the things that take up all of our time and then just add more stress to our lives during Christmas. You see, what God wants to do is God wants to give us the gift of space. And no, I'm not talking about astronauts and solar system and the Milky Way. I'm, I'm not talking about that kind of space, but I'm just talking about space, room, room to breathe, to, to time, to, time to slow down, time to decompress, to de-stress, and, and mostly, most importantly, time to spend with him and to discover his will for our lives and to know him, know him as Lord, know him as Savior, and, and, and to obey him. You see, anything, and, and I really mean anything that takes up God's space in our lives is bad. And, and for those of you who are unsure what bad means, it means not good. <laughs> it, it's not good. God, see, God orders life. He's, he's not a God of disorder. He's not a God of confusion. He's not a God of exhaustion. He's not a, he's not a God of busyness. God knows what a life uh, that's filled up, that's too filled up, that's too busy, that's out of space. He knows what that can do to us, and that's not what he wants. And so I want to read um, these two passages for us. First one in Luke chapter 2. We're going to read the first seven verses, and then we'll skip over to Ephesians 5 and read Ephesians 5, 15, and 17. Luke 2 says this, In those days... A decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered. This first registration took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. So everyone went to be registered, each to his own town. Verse 4, Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee, Galilee to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family line of David, to be registered along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Then she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him tightly in cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And you turn over to Ephesians chapter 5. Oops. Gosh, too much stuff coming out of my Bible here. Ephesians chapter 5, reading, starting in verse 15. And it says this. It says, Pay careful attention then, to how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Now, there's, in those two passages, I wanted to point out two, two things real quickly. And the first was in that Ephesians passage, which you just turned to, and it said, it said, pay attention to how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of your time. And then the, the question for us becomes, well, why? Well, the Bible answers that. It says, because the days are evil. Now, now what, is that, what does that mean? When you think of evil, here's what I want you to think of. Basically, that, that's meaning that the world we're living in is not really that interested in your following God and what that means for your life. Basically, the, the world is just kind of interested in you, making sure that you buy into whatever culture is selling. You know, and we could, we could spend a, a whole sermon here, and, but we're not. But I love that it says to, to pay attention. You know, think about someone who's, who's kind of snapping their fingers, trying, trying, trying to wave you, basically just trying, trying to get your attention and just say, listen, listen, listen focus, focus here. And, and, and they're, they're telling you to kind of, listen, wake up. Because if you don't pay attention, you'll do unwise things. You'll, you'll do foolish things. And, and if you're not paying attention, then you'll let a lot of stuff take up all the space in your life. Foolish people, unwise people, they spend their entire lives just kind of living for the here and now. And it says, the, the Bible says it, it says to make the most of your time. But that doesn't mean that you just go crazy and it's kind of like YOLO, go, you know, I only got one life to live, so I'm just going to, I'm going to go do whatever it is I want to do. That's, that's not wise, that's foolish. What it is saying is it means to make the most of every opportunity, to make the best possible use of the time in the life that God's given you. And if you're not paying attention, you'll, you'll let your calendar get filled up and you'll have, you'll have no room for God, which takes us back to 
to, to the Luke passage in, in verse 7 where it says there was no guest room available for them. They were, they were all filled up and there, there, was no, there really was no space for, for Jesus um, in that place. And, and I think sometimes, not always, but I think in, in some stories and in some plays, the innkeeper can kind of get a bad rap. Uh, sometimes he or, or, or she can be portrayed as this mean person, you know, who slams the door angrily and says, you know, we've got no room, go away. But the truth of the matter is that, that the city was completely filled because of the census that was being taken, which required everyone to go back to their hometown. Joseph and Mary had to come from Nazareth and go to Bethlehem because Joseph was from the line, from the household. He was a descendant of David. But guess what? So were a lot of other people. And there was a lot of people in David's line, in his household. There was a lot of people from other places, but they were all descending on Bethlehem. So there's just a lot of people in this city. And, and, and I'm pretty sure Priceline or Expedia didn't exist back then for Mary and Joseph to get on their smartphone real quick and, and to book a room. And, and a lot of times when we think in, we're thinking, we're thinking like hotel, but it, chances are, more than likely, it was probably a home of a relative, uh, someone that they actually knew. But it, it, was, it was a busy, it was just busy. And I don't think it was because this innkeeper or, or this relative was purposely a jerk to, to Mary and Joseph or, or being prejudiced to them for whatever. Um, they just, there just wasn't space because everything had already been filled up. And, and one thing that I know about life, and you know this, that there are just busy seasons of life. And some feel like they're, they're busier than others. And, and some seasons feel overwhelming. Some seasons you, you feel like you can manage. But, but even in busy seasons, the, the question is, just, how do we still, how do we make space for Jesus? And here's one thing that, that we all need to know, and this is in your notes, and, and you probably know this already, or, or maybe you need to be reminded of this, but it's this. We determine what fills up our space. We determine what fills up our space. Now, I know what you're immediately ar you're arguing with me in your head, and you're saying, well, no, I don't, because uh, I've, got, I've got work, I've got school, I've got a family, I've got merit, I've got all of this stuff. And, and I heard someone say this, and it may have been, I don't know who it was, I don't remember, if John Maxwell, Stephen Covey, uh, somebody said it, uh, but, but in talking about time and time management, the, this person said that it's not really time management per se because we all get the same amount of time. It's not like if you manage your time wisely, you get more of it, or, or if you're not, you get less of it. We all get 24 hours in our day. So they said instead of thinking about it as time management, that we should think of it as event management. Basically, how do we manage the stuff that's going to fill up our space and it's no big secret we we determine what goes in that space in our lives and I, I know we have work we have school we have to take care of our families we have some obligations we have we have events we have things there there are people that, that are going to automatically start filling in that space it's just kind of already you know because I already know work's going to take up some space families is going to take up some space all all these things are going to automatically happen but here's the deal. Um, but, but the only way those things take up all of the space in our lives is if we allow it to. You see, people have had jobs for thousands and thousands of years. People have had families for thousands and thousands of years. People have had responsibilities for thousands and thousands of years. Yet, a lot of people still make time for Jesus. But I know what you're saying. You said, well, they didn't have to deal with this or they didn't have to deal with that. It was a different time. They didn't, the, the, the world is just different, Jimmy. I, I'm, just, I'm just in a busy season of life. And, and I get it. And I've said that before. Um, and I, I still say it. You know, I'm guilty of still saying it. But here's, here's what I know. Because I'm in a busy season of life, it doesn't change the truth about God and what God wants for me in my life. And when I say those things, I, I can just almost hear God, just kind of a gentle reminder, just saying this, maybe just whispering it in my ear, and maybe he needs to whisper it in your ear, is pay careful attention then to how you live. Not as unwise people, but as wise. Making the most of the time because the days are evil. 
So don't be, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And I think that's, that's the reminder that he wants to give us in, in all seasons of life. So, so how do we make space in those busy seasons of our lives? How do we make the most of the time that God has given us? And what I want to do this morning is I want to speak to, to several different life stages that, are in our, that make up, help make up our church uh, today. And, and you'll notice that these are all blanks in your outline, and we're going to go, we're going to go pretty quick. And, and I don't want you to, to kind of tune me out until we get to yours, or if I get to yours first, then you can tune out the rest of them. Because quite honestly, when you get all of them, you can look at all of them, and all of them apply to every stage of life, to every busy season of life. But I, I just kind of wanted to get real specific and give each age group one thing that they can focus on. But again, this is for everyone. So we'll start, we'll start at the top. We'll start it with, with some of my favorite people in our church, and that's with our students, with our teenagers. And here's what I would say to teenagers is procrastination is not your friend. Now, now I, I know for some of you, um, and a lot of our students sit over here, and I know we've got some spread around, so I'll be, I'll be talking everywhere, but honestly, this is for everyone. I know for some of you, this is not an issue, but for a lot of teenagers, putting off things is a bad habit that we can get into that makes life unnecessarily stressful and unnecessarily busy, and I get it. I get it. Why do today what you can put off and do later when there's so many fun things that you would rather do right now? I get that. That was, that was sort of a, uh, I lived that. That was sort of my life's mission statement for a, for a lot of my growing up years. But the problem with procrastination is, and I'm not saying anything new, is it's just not wise. It's, it's very foolish. I love Proverbs. If you've never read the book of Proverbs, you should, because it's just filled with wisdom. Um, and Proverbs 14, 23 says, work brings profit, but mere talk leads to poverty. Doing stuff you know, getting things done, that's, that's what matters. And, and this whole idea of I'll do it later, I'll do it later is actually a password. And it's a password that opens up the door to a life of unwanted stress. And the problem with procrastination is, is what can be done in, in, in small chunks, if ignored long enough, will end up being one giant chunk to deal with. And then you multiply that by four or five things that, that we put off, and, and now we've got this massive issue that can no longer be ignored. And, crass, and what happens is when we have all of these things that we've ignored, then we've got to make space for us to deal with this. And what ends up happening is God gets pushed out of his space in our lives so that we can deal with this issue that we've created. And so we say things like, I don't have time for God because there's so much that I have to do. So procrastination is not your friend. Parents of preschoolers, um, here's one for you. Decide now what will be your non-negotiables. Decide now what will be your non-negotiables. We do, I, I, I think um, a lot of parents of preschool, and there may be more things out there than, than this book, but we do a lot of, and I know there is, but we do a lot of what to expect when you're expecting. But then somehow when, when, when that baby comes, it, it, it shifts things in our lives. And, and we go from what to expect from when, to when you're expecting to, I'm, I, 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 my world will, will revolve around this, this little thing and, and I'm gonna capture every moment of their life and I'm gonna blog about it and take pictures of it and put posts about it. Uh, I'm gonna protect them from every microscopic germ that might just come into this world and, and, and no one can tell me anything because this is the first be baby that's ever walked on the face of this earth and so I have to, I have to do it my way, you know? And we just get, we get real panicked. And that's not everybody, and, that, and that's kind of an exaggeration, but you get the idea. It's just that everything then just kind of becomes about this child. And I know I've been there. I've been there. But here's the deal. Um, I, I think one of the first questions that we need to ask as parents of preschoolers is this, is what type of person do I want them to be when they're all grown up? You see, as, as parents, as new parents, what we have to do is we have to begin with the end in mind. Wait, what, what type of, what type of, now again, I didn't say what are they going to be when they grow up because I think that's one of the things that we look at. Oh man, I've got, a, I've got an athlete right here. Look at that. Or look at this. I've got a brainiac. Or look at this. They're, they're, this is going to be a model. And we, we have no idea. We have no idea what, what this little person is, is, is going to become. 
But one of the things that we can start asking is, is what do I want them to be when they grow up? And what can I do now to help foster that in their lives? Joshua 24, 15 says this, but if it doesn't please you to worship the Lord, choose, your, choose for yourselves today, which will you worship? The gods your fathers worship beyond the Euphrates River or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're living? But it says this, as for me and my family, we will worship the Lord. And here's the deal. What you do now as parents sets the stage for what you will do later. And more importantly, what will be priority later. Because there will be lots. And parents, I mean lots of things that will push God out and take over that space. And before you ever get there, I think you need to decide now that as parents, we're not going to allow this child, we're not going to allow our family to get consumed by whatever that we have no space for God. Because what happens a lot of time in parenting is we become super reactionary. But I think instead of reactionary, what we need to do is we need to prepare and say, I'm not going to allow our family, I'm not going to allow this child to get consumed by anything that's going to take over the space that God has in their lives. Why? Because nothing is more important to me than my child knowing and loving God, and I will not do anything as a parent to hinder that. Okay? Now, I said that. But here's, here's, where it has to, here's where it have to go. It has to become true for you. Listen to that. Because nothing is more important to me than my child knowing and loving God, and I will not do anything as a parent to hinder that. Okay? It doesn't matter that I say that. What matters is if you begin to believe that and begin to live that. Because the greatest gift you can give to your child is a mom, is a dad who loves Jesus and teaches that to their children in word, but also in and indeed and here's listen to this parents it shouldn't come as a shock to you as your child grows up and you see in their lives that they don't make space for Jesus when that maybe was never really modeled for them by you so parents of preschoolers to make space for God determine now what will be your non-negotiables moving on parents of of school-age kids this is you know if your kids are in school all the way up first grade on or kindergarten on up to to high school uh, and maybe even college if you want to say that but a lot of kids are gone when it comes to college but here's the one I want to tell you for that it's okay to say no it's okay to say no look, look at this picture real quick maybe there you ever done that I mean you've got like there's, there's two there's two outlets there but then we've got like one two three four five you know and then we just got um, enormous amounts of and it's funny if you if you google that I, I just I I just google too many outlets I mean too many plugs for for an outlet and you just see all the massive chaos of pictures of people just plugging things into plugging things into plugging things into plugging things and 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 here's the deal that you, that this is what happens to a life an illustration. This is what happens to a life that, that never says no to anything. And that, honestly, that's a disaster waiting to happen. And, and you may have worse scenarios. You could probably go home, take a picture, and, and send it to me, and you probably may have some worse scenarios in that. And that, that's a disaster waiting to happen. And, and lives that are lived that way, with just constantly filling, 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 never saying no, never saying no, those lives are disasters waiting to happen. And I think one of the biggest enemies of space in our lives is FOMO. Any of you guys know what FOMO is? Say it out loud. Fear of missing out. There you go, you learned a new word today. It's actually not a word, but uh, it's this whole idea of fear of missing out. What if, what if my kid is not in that? What are they gonna miss? Well, what if my kid doesn't do, they, they, that looks real, I mean, there's, there's some kids in there that look, that, I need them to do that. Well, 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 my kid needs to take all AP or all, all this stuff, and, 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 because if they don't, what are they gonna miss? Well, they gotta be at this, what are they gonna miss? And so we just, we're constantly saying yes to things because we're afraid of what our kids are gonna miss, but honestly, if, if we were to kind of turn it around, we might say as parents, what am I gonna miss? What, am I, what are people going to say about me if 
I'm not in this or my kids aren't in this. Well, my kids aren't doing it. Well, why don't your kids do this? Well, what's going on? Why, why all this? You're not a part. And, and so it's this, this fear we have. And so we feel like that we have to kind of push our kids into things and we have to keep pushing and pushing and pushing and meanwhile all of our pushing what we're doing is recreating kids that are overstressed kids that are overbooked kids that, that don't know how to deal with life because so much stuff is on their plates and and it's okay to say no romans 12 uh, 2 says this and do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes so that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. And I, this is one of my favorite verses of all times because this, is, this is message is, is simple, but it is so powerful. The reason that we don't, we, we don't have to worry about FOMO, about fear of missing out, the reason why we're, we don't conform to the world is because if we're busy conforming, then we can't be transforming. And transformation leads to discovering God's will for our lives. If you're busy conforming, then you can't be transforming. Transforming from a mindset of, you know what, I'm going to fill up all this space because I don't want my kids to miss out. I don't want us to miss out. You're, you're transforming from that kind of attitude to kind of dying to the calendar and saying, God, what, how do you want to fill up this space? You see, the world says you got to say yes or you'll miss out. God says that if you say yes to the world, then you won't have space for me. And imagine now the, the space, and, and some of you could do this, and you're probably already thinking some things, but imagine now the space that you would have in your life if you said no to some of the things right now that are in your life that you've already said yes to. And if you were honest about some of that stuff, it, was, it seemed really important at the time that you said yes, but ultimately it was just something that ends up eating your time and causing you stress. So it's okay, I want to give you permission from here to say no. Uh, single adults, moving on. Here's what I would say to single adults. Bouts of loneliness will compete for space. And again, I, I say this, um, and, and all of these apply, not just to, to these particular groups I'm talking to, they apply to all of us. Bouts of loneliness will compete for space. In, in talking about this, or getting ready for this, I, I, I reached out to uh, several several single adults um, in, in, one, in a common word that kept coming up in my conversations uh, with them was, was loneliness. And it, it's not that loneliness consumed every waking moment of their lives. I mean, it's not a, oh, poor me. It, it wasn't that. And, and it's not that they were saying that, that being single was bad, but the, the theme was, but there are times where those waves of loneliness come in and what single adults have to be careful of is they have to be careful that they don't let that loneliness cause them to fill up the space and, and fill up their calendars so that they, 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 they can avoid something. And sometimes what, what gets filled up in that space is not just activity, but uh, the, one of the things that they mentioned was that, that space can get filled up with, with self-pity. And honestly, it's no matter if you're single or married or, or, or somewhere in between, uh, emotional decision-making doesn't always lead to wise decisions. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23 says, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. You see, God never wants us to turn to something or someone to medicate what we're dealing with. God's compassion, it never fails. And filling a calendar because we want to avoid some type of negative emotion is not a cure. More, it's, it's sort of a band-aid on a bigger issue. And wisdom says when I feel lonely or when I feel overwhelmed or when I feel whatever, I don't need to run, I don't need to run from it to something else. What I need to do is I need to face it and remember that God is faithful. And that's true no matter what your relationship status is. Instead of running from things, maybe we should stop running and ask, God, what are you up to in this? God, what are you telling me in this? One of the greatest pieces of advice I ever received in my counseling when I was going to counseling was this, is, is instead of running from your anxiety, it said, what if you just kind of stood up to it and say, what, what do you want? 
and then ask the question, God, what are you up to? And that changed, it was a difference maker in my life. But like I said, emotional decision making doesn't always make for wise decisions. The next one, our empty nesters. Here's what I would, here's uh, just a, a tool for empty nesters. Fight against the temptation to drift. Fight against the temptation to drift. One of the, well, the, the, the trends that, that we see is, is that when kids leave home and the nest is empty, mom and dad suddenly realize that their connection to church really was their kids. And you see this in marriages too. A lot of times you, you, you talk about uh, uh, like one of the terms is, is, is gray divorce and, and it's because once the kids leave the home and, and the parents are older, it's like, okay, well, the only thing we really had in common were our kids and I don't really know you and I don't know you and, and so like, why, why, why are we married? You know, one of the reasons why adults get back, come back into church a lot of times is when they start to have kids because all of a sudden the, the church becomes this priority again and then a uh, a reason why a lot of adults leave the church is because of their kids. And the tendency becomes to attend less and less because there's not a real, uh, a real or, or a strong connection. And on top of that, now, as an empty nester, you kind of already have built-in reasons, built in reasons to kind of to, to, to fill up your space because now you've got time to travel. You've got some, you know, some discretionary money. You're, you're going to go see your kids. Hey, now you're going to go see your grandkids. And, and what happens, and it's often unintentionally, but empty nesters can become disconnected to the things of God, to, to God's family. And, and, and you know how this goes. Once you feel disconnected, then it's just easier and easier to stop being a part of those things. It gets easier to be somewhere else than to be where you know you should be. And again, I don't think it's always intentional. It's, it's a season of life. It's a season of life, and, and if you're not careful, if you're not anchored uh, to, to your church family, if you're not anchored to a small group, if you're not ankled, ankled, anchored to a ministry in your church, if you're not anchored to this relationship, to the things of God, then you will just slowly and slowly drift away. And when you drift, you fill up your space with a whole lot of things, a, a lot of good things, but I think we miss the things that God wants for us. Colossians 3, 1 and 2 says, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on earthly things. And here's the, here's the thing, the best way to fill up your space and to fill up your space and to push God out of your life is to set your mind on earthly things. Our relationship with God should change it should change our perspectives. It should change our priorities. It should change our goals. It should change our motivations. I mean, literally, it should change who we are. And no matter what stage of life you're in, no matter how busy your season of life gets, the way to kind of anchor yourself is to always look up and look up to God. Senior adults, I was getting to you. You knew it was coming. Here's the thing I would say to senior adults, and that's this. And again, this applies to everyone. Don't, your age doesn't minimize your influence. You know what the temptation is for a lot of older adults? It's to assume that their space no longer matters. So I'll just fill it up with whatever I want to fill it up with. Because, you know, in, 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 in the church world or in God's world, I'm, I'm kind of too old to, to do some things, too old to teach, too old to minister, too old to go on trips, too old to, to minister to kids or to students. I'm too old to, to talk to young adults because I'm out of touch. I, I'm too old. And, and, and I, want, I want our older adults to hear something. Physically, physically, you may not be able to do some of the things that you used to do, but you're never too old to be used by God. And let me say it this way, you're never too young to be used by God. God wants to use your life, he wants to use your experiences, he wants to use your victories, he wants to use your mistakes, your struggles, he wants to use those to help the generation behind you and other generations and the generation that's walking with you too to know of his faithfulness, to know of his love, his mercy, his power and his salvation. Don't say that I'm too old. Don't say that, because when you say, I'm too old, you're saying, God, you can't have my space. I'm too young. I'm too this. I'm too that. 
It doesn't matter where you are. I'm too busy. <laughs> when you say that, you're saying, God, you can't have my space. Acts 4, 18 through 20 says, so they called for them and ordered them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. And Peter and John, this, this is who they've arrested and this is who they've ordered, answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God for us to listen to you rather than to God, that's up to you. You guys decide whether that's right or wrong. But here's the deal. For we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. A life that's been transformed by God, you know what? You can't help but talk about what you've seen, what you've heard, what you've experienced. Peter and John said, you think what you think, but we can't help talking about Jesus, so we're gonna keep talking about him. We're gonna keep loving him. We're gonna keep serving him. We're gonna keep telling other people about him, and we're gonna keep doing it until either you make us be quiet by killing us, or God makes us be quiet because he's gonna take us up home to heaven. And I said this earlier, and I want to say it again. I know life can be crazy. I know it can get overwhelming. I know it can get busy. I've been a high school student. Um, I've been a single adult. I've been a parent of a preschooler. I am a parent of, of school-aged children. I'm, I've, I've started in this, this area of life where, you know, you start caring for, for parents who are getting older. I, there's, there's lots of... I, so I, I'm not standing up here going, pointing the finger I'm, I'm kind of want to jump in this pool with you and say, we're all here together. But, but I know this, I know this. A life, and I said this in the kid sermon, a life that has no space for God is a life that is not lived according to his will. We can fill our space up with good things and still miss God. And one of the, the things that might help us in this area, instead of, uh, of thinking of it as my space, what if we started looking at it as God's space. And I'm gonna stop acting like it's all mine. And I hope, I hope we don't miss him this season, okay? But this is bigger than just Christmas. Um, I, I hope we don't miss God, period, because we have no more space. Do, do, do you have room? Here's, here's the question. Do you have room for Jesus? And if your answer is no, Maybe it's time that we make room.